Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Kate Person, who I'm delighted to welcome today. She's an assistant professor of neuropsychology at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. She's been at UCSF for some years, having come here from UC San Diego, where she earned her PhD. She is an expert on uh, the evaluation of, uh, and understanding of cognitive function and dysfunction, particularly in people with neurodegenerative disorders of the sort that we're talking about today, so Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonian syndromes of various sort. And she's going to be talking to us today about strategies for combating cognitive decline in Parkinson's disease. She is an expert on uh, the evaluation of, uh, and understanding of cognitive function and dysfunction, particularly in people with neurodegenerative disorders of the sort that we're talking about today, so Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonian syndromes of various sort. And she's going to be talking to us today about strategies for combating cognitive decline in Parkinson's disease. Okay. All right, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here today. So Parkinson's disease was described by a doctor named James Parkinson in 1817, and he eloquently described the motor syndrome of this illness. He did comment that the senses and intellects are not injured in Parkinson's disease, but we've come to learn that that's not always true, that in fact cognitive changes are common in Parkinson's disease. So many individuals with Parkinson's disease have some mild cognitive difficulties, maybe with memory or multitasking. Dementia is also common. So dementia is more common in Parkinson's disease than in other people the same age. Cognitive impairment is strongly associated with quality of life. So in most studies looking at this, cognitive impairment was a better predictor of quality of life than the severity of a movement disorder. And so today I'm going to discuss strategies to improve cognitive function and quality of life in Parkinson's disease. So let me start by telling you about two different patients that I've seen in clinic with Parkinson's disease with details changed to protect their identity. Um, I think this will help show the heterogeneity of cognitive function in Parkinson's. So Mr. M, when I saw him, was 70 years old, three-year history of Parkinson's, still working part-time as a lawyer, good decision-making, no report of memory loss, and his complaints said he was doing just fine at work, his coworkers. But he feels it takes him longer to do his work. So things, his work feels more effortful than it used to. He finds it a bit harder to focus and multitask. He's still generally a good driver, but his wife complains that sometimes he drives too close to other cars or has trouble parallel parking, which he didn't used to. But you can see he's, he's still functioning quite well and functioning independently. Mr. G, when I saw him, was 66 years old, also with a three-year history of Parkinson's. He had stopped working and driving. He has difficulty with finances, he misplaces items frequently, and he has trouble with multitasking. He fluctuates in his ability to pay attention and frequently needs to take naps. He reports hallucinations of people traveling through the walls and has a history of anxiety in the last um, several years. And he was given the diagnosis of Parkinson's with dementia. So two patients with a history of um, Parkinson's for the same amount of time, but having a really different experience in terms of their level of cognitive function and their quality of life. So there's a spectrum of cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. About a third of individuals have normal cognitive abilities. We really can't pick up anything different from age-matched healthy individuals. Um, about a third have mild cognitive difficulties. So they might have some mild impairments on memory or other tasks, but they're still functioning independently. And then a third of patients have dementia, and that means that their cognitive impairment is bad enough to interfere with their everyday functioning. So again, I'll just define these important terms again. Mild cognitive impairment is when you have mild cognitive difficulties. Could be in memory, multitasking, attention, 
visual spatial skills, for example, or some combination, but you can still function independently. Dementia is when that cognitive impairment gets bad enough that it's interfering with your everyday functions. And you need help, really, to, to function well. Um, this is usually caused by Alzheimer's disease, so that's the most common cause of dementia, but it's also caused, can be caused by Parkinson's disease. And when that happens, we call that Parkinson's disease with dementia. So just a few more terms I wanted to mention to you. These are some terms regarding dementia you might hear about. So Parkinson's disease with dementia is when the dementia occurs after the established Parkinson's disease. So you have Parkinson's for a while, and then you get dementia. Dementia with Lewy bodies is a, is a related disease where dementia occurs either before the motor symptoms or at the same time. But really, these diseases are hard to distinguish um, without thinking about that timeline. So if you were to do a brain autopsy on a patient who has Parkinson's with dementia, their brain would look a lot like someone who had dementia with Lewy bodies. And the last term I wanted to mention is Lewy body dementia, and that's an umbrella term that includes both of those diseases. Okay, so this is an outline for the rest of my talk, and I'm going to be focusing on strategies to maximize cognitive function and quality of life in Parkinson's disease. First, I'll talk about memory strategies for probably the first third of the talk. These are things that you can do to help your memory, and in fact, this is not just for people with Parkinson's disease. Next, we'll talk about neurotransmitter changes in Parkinson's disease and that affect cognition and how we can compensate for that with certain medications. Then physical exercise, which you heard a little bit about from Dr. Christine, um, mental exercise, reducing stress. And at the end, I'll tell you about the care ecosystem, which is a new supportive uh, type of care for patients who have dementia and their caregivers. All right, so first we'll talk about memory strategies. And I think we'll start by taking a memory test. So that'll get us thinking about how memory works. I'm gonna show you some people and I want you to remember their names. Okay, we'll come back to them in a moment and see if you can remember their name. So let's break apart memory. There's really three parts to a task like that, okay? So the first part is rehearsal. The first you need to have immediate memory or working memory for new information. You have to be able to just get it in uh, in those first moments. That requires a lot of attention um, and, or, or working memory. The second part is encoding. You have to be able to lay information down in a more resilient kind of store so that you can access it later. And then the third is retrieval. So even if you get it into that more resilient store, you need to be able to retrieve it when you want that information. So there's three parts, and there's really three places it can go wrong. So how does this work from a brain perspective? Our frontal circuits help us with that immediate working memory for new information. Then the information is processed by the hippocampus that encodes that information into the longer term stores. And sometimes will represent information in other parts of cortex. When you want to get that information back out, and when you want to access that information that you stored, you need to retrieve it, and again, using those frontal circuits. So in Alzheimer's disease, where Alzheimer's patients are known to have memory problems, this is because their hippocampus is affected. It's one of the earliest sites of disease in Alzheimer's disease. And so these patients may be able to immediately recall what you said to them, but then they don't effectively put it into longer term stores. So even if you give them prompts and cues to help them retrieve that information later, they might not be able to remember it because it wasn't encoded by the hippocampus. That's a really hard problem to deal with in terms of memory strategies. 
In Parkinson's disease, it's really a different pattern, where first of all, the memory problems are not as bad as Alzheimer's disease, but also the parts of memory that are affected are different. It's the rehearsal or working memory and the retrieval parts that are most affected. So now I'm going to talk about some strategies that can help us compensate for those difficulties. And really, these strategies can work for people without Parkinson's disease, too. So this is the CPR for your memory. You can make connections, make, in other words, semantically elaborate on information. As much as you can make those connections personally salient, the more likely you will, will be to remember them. And also repeating the retrieval process can help. And I'm going to tell you more about what I mean by this CPR for your memory. Okay, so remember Barbara. Let's make some connections to her name being Barbara. Let's semantically elaborate on this connection, okay, by making more connections. For example, you might think, imagine her singing like Barbara Streisand. You might imagine her holding a Barbie doll. Or you think Barbara begins with B. Um, let's think of, imagine she has a stack of books on her head, and then maybe it'll help you remember that her name becomes with B, and that'll help you retrieve her name. So we're semantically elaborating on the link between Barbara and her. Now, the more we can make these connections personally salient, the better we will be at remembering them. So let's try this. So her name is June. Perhaps you can, perhaps the month of June means something special to you. Is there someone you love who has a birthday in June? Special anniversary? Do you have memories associated with the month of June that you can sort of think about while you think about her? Perhaps you knew somebody named June who you had an emotional response to, someone you cared about. Uh, maybe you can bring up a memory of them when you think of her. So the more you can make the connections personally salient, the better you will be at remembering them. So we said that it's the CPR for your memory, so we talked about connections, making it personal, and then repetition is the third one, and it's really repetition of the retrieval process. So the more you try to bring up that memory that you laid down, the stronger the retrieval access is going to be. So what was her name again? But good. And if you practice that, you know, every few minutes for an hour, you probably never forget her name was Barbara. All right, well, let's try those strategies. Just everyone try them on your own. So try some connections, maybe making them personal, and repeating in your mind um, that his name is Donald. Now try it for Maya. And try for Jackson. Okay, so what is her name? Great, you guys are set for your next cocktail party. <laughs> All right, so here's some more memory strategies. And some of the memory strategies I'm going to go over now are really good for people who have just very mild memory problems. And some of the strategies are really um, suited for people who have more advanced memory problems and are really strategies that the, a caregiver would implement. So I just wanted to mention that some of these strategies might work for you and other ones won't work for you. Okay, so. Um, Calendars, keeping calendars and keeping them organized and writing everything in it and using them on a regular basis. Electronic reminders, often these can be great for medications. The daily list, and this is one that's, I think, used mostly by caregivers. So a caregiver can, um, for a patient who has, you know, more advanced memory problems, can write down every day what is important for that, their loved one to know that day 
and always put it in the same place. And do it consistently, because then um, your loved one will learn the routine of when they are confused or forgot something they know they need to know, they, they know there's one place they can go and the information will probably be there. For example, maybe you want to put it at their place at the kitchen table or um, you know, by their bed or hanging on the kitchen wall, something like that. So if you do it every day, the, the routine will really help. Here's an example of a daily list for, um, so for a patient written by a caregiver. So I'm at the grocery store, your breakfast is on the table, please be dressed and ready to go at 10 a.m. Um, and this evening we have dinner plans with our friends. So just the information that they need to know that day, such as where you are and what they have on their agenda. Cultivating organization and routine. So the more you can have things organized and done the same way, um, the less demands there are on someone's memory. So if you can uh, keep objects in the same place, misplacing items is so common in Parkinson's disease, so trying to make sure things go in their place. Keeping your house neat, and then doing daily tasks in the same way at the same time can also be helpful. Visual spatial processing is uh, problems are common in Parkinson's disease. Remember that uh, first case I showed you where he was having some mild visual spatial problems with the driving. So individuals with Parkinson's disease have been shown to drive more safely during high contrast conditions, like during daylight. So you may feel more comfortable driving during daylight than in the evening. Um, you make important possessions visually distinct so you don't misplace them or if you do misplace them, you can find them more easily. And um, night lights and reflector tapes can also be very helpful to avoid um, falls or accidents when navigating the house at nighttime. Okay, so that's, that was the memory strategy part of my talk. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about neurotransmitters and cognition in Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's affects cells in the brainstem that normally produce important brain chemicals including dopamine, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, and serotonin. And the depletion of a lot of these neurotransmitters can result in cognitive changes. This includes dopamine can alter, uh, dopamine loss can alter movement and cognition. Acetylcholine loss can alter cognition and sleep. Uh, noradrenaline can alter mood and cognition, and serotonin mood. So it's really important to realize that a lot of these symptoms are caused by these changes in neurotransmitters, and this can oftentimes be helped with medication. So I'll talk a little bit about dopamine and acetylcholine. So of course we think about how the loss of dopamine in Parkinson's causes the movement syndrome, we think about that a lot, but also can affect cognitive symptoms. So we're talking about the loss of these dopamine projections from the midbrain to the substantia, from the substantia nigra to the, um, to the caudate and the putamen, which are called the striatum. And so the loss of these projections um, results in dysfunction in, in cortical subcortical loops. So this dopamine normally regulates the functioning of these circuits with cortex, including the frontal subcortical circuits. And the loss of dopamine can dysregulate this function. And this causes uh, cognitive symptoms as well as motor symptoms. So dopamine medications may not only improve your movement, they may also improve your cognition. For example, they've been shown to improve working memory and multitasking. However, it's important to be aware that there's also evidence that taking a lot of dopamine medications can actually cause cognitive problems as well. So if you overdose certain brain circuits with dopamine, you get too much in some circuits, you can actually get symptoms like um, pathological gambling, hypersexuality, excessive shopping. Acetylcholine is also quite affected by Parkinson's disease. So in this study, where they looked at acetylcholine activity in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and Parkinson's disease with dementia, they showed there's actually more reduction in acetylcholine um, in Parkinson's than in Alzheimer's disease, and even especially in Parkinson's with dementia. So if you don't have enough acetylcholine activity in your brain, you may have problems with attention. 
like fluctuations in your thinking skills, excessive daytime sleepiness, and just difficulty paying attention. And the good news is, is that medications that boost acetylcholine can help with a lot of these symptoms. So you might want to talk to your doctor about um, drugs like Aricept or Exelon. These drugs boost the level of available acetylcholine in the brain. You also want to talk to your doctor to make sure that you're not taking drugs that might decrease acetylcholine in the brain. So medications like certain antihistamines, Benadryl, certain muscle relaxants, and medications for urinary incontinence can actually decrease the levels of acetylcholine in the brain. And since Parkinson's patients already have low levels, this can cause um, even more interruptions in their cognitive skills. So here's one slide that summarizes uh, a lot of important facts about medications in Parkinson's with regard to cognition. And um, I, I'm not a, I don't prescribe medications myself, I'm a neuropsychologist, but a, a pharmacist who specializes in this helped me prepare this slide. So, um, so medications can help cognition and mood, and as we talked about the dopamine medications, the cholinergic agents, and also antidepressants can be very helpful in Parkinson's disease. Some medications can worsen Parkinson's disease, and this includes um, many antipsychotic medications, especially what's called the typical antipsychotics, but really antipsychotics in general should be prescribed with a lot of caution. Also some anti-nausea medications. And there's medications that can worsen cognition in Parkinson's, including um, those anticholinergic agents I just mentioned, muscle relaxants, medications for urinary incontinence, and also benzodiazepines, opiates, and sleep medicines like Ambien should be used with a lot of caution. And in general, you know, when you start a new medication, start one at a time and start slowly so you can really be aware of how it's affecting you. All right, so here's the, um, the outline of the strategies that I'm talking about today. And we've already talked about the memory strategies and the neurotransmitter changes. So on to physical exercise. Okay, so motor impairments can incline many patients with PD towards a sedentary lifestyle. But exercise can improve mobility, range of motion, and muscle tone, and can also improve thinking skills, improve mood, and might uh, slow down the disease via neuroplasticity. Of course, safety issues must be considered, and you may want to work with a physical therapist who has expertise in Parkinson's disease. So I'll just review two studies. Dr. Christine reviewed a really important study as well on this topic. There are a number of them out there right now that show that, Parkinson, that exercise in Parkinson's disease can be very helpful not only for movement, but also for cognition. So in this study, the patients engaged in twice-weekly 60-minute aerobic activity, and the patients who engaged in that activity did better on cognitive tests than the ones who didn't. Okay, so in this study, the um, patients performed three one-hour sessions weekly for eight weeks of intensive um, interval-based training on stationary bicycles, and the exercise was associated with an increase in brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a protein in our brains that helps support neurons, keep them healthy, and can even help grow new neurons. <laughs> exercise can boost your mood as well. So depressed patients who exercise show a reduction in depression. This is well known. And can also reduce anxiety. So it's never too late to start exercising. And so I encourage you, if you're not already on a regular exercise routine, and this applies to everyone in the room, um, work with a personal trainer if that helps you, and find a way to build it into your daily routine. Reducing vascular changes can be also good for your brain. So what's good for your heart is good for your brain. It's important to manage hypertension, diabetes, and cholesterol because these things can impact our brain function. Eat a heart-healthy diet, manage stress, and of course, exercise. Now, mental exercise has also been shown to be protective of our brain function. Several studies suggest that the degree of baseline mental activity is associated with a reduced risk of developing dementia. 
But it's not just baseline activity. Environmental enrichment can modify a rat brain at any age, and, and probably a human brain as well. Staying socially engaged is associated with healthy aging. So if you can find a way to challenge your brain and stay socially engaged at the same time, great. I, I recommend to my patients that they choose mental exercise that they enjoy. If you find those you know, computer games to challenge your cognition fun, great. If you don't like them, don't do them. Choose something else that you enjoy. When you feel good, your brain functions better. Our mind functions best when we are well rested, relaxed, and have a positive attitude. Depression is common, but you don't have to live with that depression. And I encourage you, if you are having symptoms of depression, to talk to your doctor. Therapy and medications can be helpful. Also, staying socially engaged and exercising can help. All right, so I'm almost done with my talk. I just want to tell you now about the CARE ecosystem. So the CARE ecosystem is a research study where we're studying supportive care for patients with dementia and their caregivers. So if you have dementia, which again is cognitive impairment that's severe enough to interfere with your everyday functions, or someone you love has dementia or you know someone with dementia, then listen to these next few slides. So this is a new model of care where um, we support the caregiver. And the emphasis is on dementia of all types, but we have a particular emphasis on Parkinson's disease dementia. And we are funded to study this new model of care um, by a large grant from Medicare. So in my opinion, in the opinion of my colleagues, major changes to dementia care are badly needed. Most patients are taken care of by their primary care physicians, um, who often don't have the time, the resources, or the specialized training to properly care for patients with these, this illness. Care should be continuous, so caregivers can access information and support when they need it. Care should be proactive. Caregivers and patients need to plan for future challenges and deal with problems before they become emergencies. And the care plan needs to be personalized, and tailored for the needs and strengths of each patient and their family. We're studying this intervention throughout California and in Nebraska and Iowa, enrolling uh, 2,100 patients and their caregivers into the trial. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how the care works. You can see if it might be of interest to you or someone you know. At the center of the care is the um, care team navigator. So the care team navigator, you can see represented by that circle in the middle, is um, someone who doesn't necessarily have formal medical training, but we train them in how to take care of dementia patients and their caregivers. And this person reaches out to the patient and caregiver at least monthly, usually more often, to help them work through um, our different modules of care, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And it's also available whenever the patient and caregiver have a question or concern about dementia care. So this person becomes sort of your, your main contact, someone you develop a real relationship with to help you manage the complexities of dementia. The care team navigator is backed by an expert uh, clinical team of a pharmacist, a nurse, and a social worker who all they do is think about dementia and how to help dementia patients. And the care team navigator coordinates care for the primary care physician and any other physicians involved in their care. So what is a care team navigator? This is Julia, she's actually our first care team navigator. And if we select people who are friendly, warm, organized, enthusiastic, the kind of person you'd want to talk to on the phone and you could trust to help you with your care. Um, and this care team navigator provides telephone-based care coordination, education, and support. So it's all provided over the telephone or over the web. <coughs> These are the four modules of care that the care team navigator focuses on with their patients. So we do a very careful review of medications of every patient by an expert pharmacist, actually the one who helped me develop that slide. And so we review all of their medications, make sure they're on the right medications and not on any of the wrong medications. We make sure their medication lists that their doctors have are accurate. We provide caregiver support. So we offer suggestions and advice about caring for the patient, 
help manage um, behaviors the patient might have, and link uh, patients and caregivers to community resources that are just right for them. Decision making is a really important piece. We help make sure all of our patients and caregivers have thought through medical, legal, and financial um, planning. We believe that patients should, and their families should be thinking about these issues early in the illness while the patient can still contribute to these decisions as much as possible. We want to make sure that these decisions are thought through so you don't have to make decisions in an emergency situation. And the last module is called Functional Monitoring, and this is an optional extra module for people who want to participate. We give our, the patients smartphones and smart watches and put sensors around their home and measure their movement patterns. And this way we can detect when there's a change in their movement that might signal that something is wrong. And we can also see if they're taking their medications. So I think this is going to be really helpful for monitoring patients with Parkinson's disease. So this is my last slide. Um, I, do you qualify for this study? So we're looking for people who have a diagnosis of dementia. Um, such as Parkinson's disease with dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies. The caregiver uh, also need, uh, needs to agree to participate, and they need to have Medicare or Medicaid insurance because Medicare is funding our study. I have lots of brochures with me, and there's also some on the registration table, or you can go to careecosystem.com. And all these services are, are freely provided, of course, as part of the research study. So thank you very much for your attention today. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I won't call you Barbara, I won't call you Joe, uh, June, I will call you Kate.